God is our God is excellent. I don't I don't think you heard me, I because if you heard me you would have responded a little differently. I say our God is excellent. Hallelujah. Our God is excellent. Our God is excellent. <laughs> some of y'all, some of y'all act like you don't know what's going on. It's called a move of the Holy Spirit. It's called the Shekinah glory of God. Resting upon the people of God. <laughs> Somebody need to shout hallelujah. If 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 you can feel the presence of the Lord, you ought to tell him thank you. Oh, come on. If you if you really feel his presence, you ought to tell him thank you. Y'all let me preach. Y'all let me preach. I'm, I'm trying to act like I got some sense, y'all. Y'all let me preach. But when you talk about Jesus... He's a friend of mine. Do y'all know it? I, I'm going I'm to act right. I'm going to act right. I'm going to act right. Yeah. It's all right to have a little church. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let me preach, let me preach. Let me preach, let me preach. We got to get out of here. Let me, let me preach, let me preach. Acts, Acts chapter. Acts chapter number four. Acts chapter number four. will serve as our text for today, Acts chapter number four. Hallelujah, bless his name. Acts chapter number four, verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter number four. Verses 19 and 20. Therein you will find written these words, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, them being the Sanhedrin, 
whether it is right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I want to talk for the next little while from the sermonic theme. Simply, I want to talk about stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I've got about 15 minutes to preach this, so I need you to pray with me. This book of Acts, this book of Acts, uh, is a very pivotal and powerful book. For this epistle or this book called Acts serves as a transitory book or a transitioning book from the writings of the Gospels into what are called the church epistles or the epistles that have been penned by the Apostle Paul concerning the implementation of Christian doctrine and principles and what the church and what the believer is supposed to do and how the believer and church are to perform in the world. It is a powerful book because some call it the Acts of the Apostles. That theologically is incorrect. The essence of the book is that it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It deals with the working of the Holy Spirit. The very opening of the book deals with the rendering or deals with the presentation or deals with what is called the advent of the Holy Spirit in the earth. More commonly, it, re it is referred to as the day of Pentecost. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost that the Spirit of God showed up. And the Spirit of God fell upon them. The Spirit of God made his grand entrance into planet Earth. And so this book called Acts deals explicitly with the work of the Holy Spirit in and through the lives of the apostles. Uh, the premise of the book is that the Holy Spirit just as he worked and was effective in the lives of the apostles, the Holy Spirit can do the very same thing in the lives of anyone who surrenders themselves unto God. The Holy Spirit wants to use us. Uh, the Holy Spirit wants to indwell us. Uh, the Holy Spirit wants to occupy us. And I'm getting ready to use a word that you don't necessarily like in this 21st century, and that is the Holy Spirit wants to control us. He wants to be the boss. He, he, he wants to set up residency in us in order that he may use us not unto our own glory nor our own will, but to use us unto the glory and the will of God. It is, it is the purpose and the duty of the Holy Spirit to distract and to divert us away from our humanism in order that we might be connected toward the divinity that dwells within us. Yes, the operative role of the Holy Spirit is to make us more like Christ 
and less like ourselves. The experience of life on a daily basis is that we become more like Jesus and less like us. It's to be drawn closer to God. And in order for us to be drawn closer to God, it means that we have to walk further from our natural state. And the Spirit of God leads us and guides us into all truths. The word true by definition, Bishop Lee deals with him revealing unto us the essence of those things that are most relevant and significant through the eyes of God. God wants to, yes, God wants to pull off the cover so that God can reveal unto us the essence of who he is. Might I remind you today, you can never fully obtain who Jesus is until you digress and lose your self. Jesus set up the criteria for those who would be called his disciples simply by saying to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me daily. And so it is the duty of the Holy Spirit to control us. It is the duty of the Holy Spirit to use us and to utilize the gifts, talents, and abilities that we've been entrusted by God to maximize them that the kingdom of God may be glorified, that the kingdom of God may be lifted up, that the kingdom of God may be exalted. Jesus, by his own admission, declared, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And so then, the operative mission of the Holy Spirit is to help us, to direct us, to guide us, to steer us, to motivate us, to inspire us, to lift up Jesus. It isn't about us, but it's about Jesus. And so the text is an interesting text because the Spirit of God has fallen and, and the apostles are now doing the will and, and the work of God. And you must understand that whenever God wants to use you, you can always anticipate a period of persecution. You need to know, my brothers and sisters, that the enemy who is Satan, the enemy who is Lucifer, the enemy who is the devil does not want you to be utilized by the Spirit of God. Often, often I share with individuals as long as you're not doing anything, the devil is not concerned about you. As long as you're not engaged nor involved in lifting up Jesus, the enemy really doesn't care much about you. He considers you to be irrelevant. He considers you to be insignificant. He, he considers you not uh, to be a major game player. But as soon as you begin to yield to the Holy Spirit, as soon as you begin to, yes, to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God, the enemy enemy will put you in his crosshairs and you can anticipate persecution you can anticipate rejection you can anticipate people talking about you you can anticipate people even lying on you you can anticipate people putting you down talk to me somebody when the Lord begins to use you when the power of the Holy Spirit begins to resonate and and manifest through you folk ain't gonna like you they gonna call you a holy roller they gonna call you get this somebody who thinks you all of that and a bag of chips they're gonna talk about you cause you lift your hand you praise the Lord you say man you shout hallelujah they declare it doesn't take all of that but can I tell you on today that when the Spirit of God is really moving in your life it's like having fire Fire on the inside of you and the last time I checked fire burns up some stuff fire is hot 
fire. Talk to me, somebody. You can't set on fire. You can't hold your hand over fire. It burns you. That's the way the Holy Spirit is when you have the Holy Spirit down inside of you and he's in control of your life. It makes you act like you've lost your mind. Listen, the text is a powerful text. You've got to anticipate that when you are being led by the Spirit, you will be persecuted. And let me share something with you, and I pray that you leave with this, is that the greatest persecution is not mm -hmm, without, but the greatest persecution is within. The greatest persecution does not come from outside the church. The greatest persecution comes from within the church. Why does it come from within the church? Because the reality is that everyone in the church is not spiritual. Ninety-nine percent of people within the church are religious. But it is a bare minimum who are spiritual. Oh, don't get quiet on me. Amen. You see, religiosity is guided by pomp and circumstance. It's gotten quiet in here. Come on, come on. Religiosity is based on ceremonial guidelines, protocol, and rules. How do I know it? Because it's in the text. Let me share with you what happens in the text. Well, there are three points that I want to raise. Because if you're going to stand up for Jesus and be guided by the Holy Spirit, then get this. You have to learn the distinctive difference between being religious and spiritual. Let's look at what the text says. I've got about six minutes to deal with it. The first thing that I see in the text is that if you're going to stand up for Jesus, you've got to be performers of his work. You've got to be performers of his. Somebody say he is. Of his work. Well, well, let's look at this. Let's look at how we get to chapter number 4, verses 19 and 20. In order to understand how we get to chapter 4, you've got to go back to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, will lay the groundwork. Well, let's look at what happens. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Get this, being the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his birth was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them, get this, that entered into the temple. It says, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked, an arm and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said look on us look on us and he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something from them then Peter said silver and gold have I none but such as I have give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and Walk, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. If you're going to stand up for Jesus, stay with me somebody. You come to understand that money ain't the solution to everything. Stay with me. You come to understand, get this, 
that this man needed and was begging arms. Arms simply suggest that he was looking for a temporary solution to a permanent problem. He was looking for somebody to break him off a little something something that would have only gotten him through the day and on the next morning he would have been there begging all over again. But understand something today, that when you really stand up for Jesus, you come to understand that you're not trying to be a quick fix for a permanent problem. You come to understand that you have on the inside of you what is needed to be able to meet the needs in the lives of people. Can I tell you on today that it ain't all about money, it's not all about carnal stuff, but it's about the power of God that is in your life. Somebody needs you to stand up and be a child of God. Listen to what Peter and John said. They said, look on us. In other words, by looking at us, you're going to see vessels that are used for the glory and the honor of God. We don't have the money that you need, but we've got something that is better than money. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There is a saying that says, why give a man a fish when you can teach him to fish for himself? He- hello, somebody. Listen, listen. He, if you're going to stand up for Jesus, we've got to be performers of his work. Well, we've got to understand something that his work it is not a work that can be easily performed. Stay with me, somebody. Can I share with you today that we've got to invest in the lives of people? Notice something. The experience with Peter and John helps us to understand this. If you're going to invest something, you've got to invest that that is deep in you. Stay with me, somebody. You've got to invest that which is deep in you. You cannot put temporary salve on an open soul. Can I share something with you? What the wino needs is Jesus. What the dope addict needs is Jesus. Wish I had some help here. What, what our young folk need is Jesus. We, we, we equip them to try to earn money, but the bottom line is they need Jesus. Because can I tell you on the day and somebody is a witness up in here and I've been there in my own life. Can I be transparent? There have been times that I've been broke, but I had Jesus. There have been times that I've been disappointed, but I had Jesus. There have been times when friends have forsaken me, but I've had Jesus. And I've discovered in life that as long as I've got Jesus, as long as I've got the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, then I have what is essential to help me to overcome the obstacles in my life. Jesus. Stay with me, stay with me. They were performers of his work. But get this, they were also possessors of his power. Because what happens, what happens? When you look over in chapter 4, in verse number 8, you will discover that they encounter persecution. If you're going to stand up for Jesus, you can't be a coward. If you're going to stand up for Jesus, you can't hide behind the crowd and say, when they say, who's with Jesus? I am. You got to stand 
for Jesus. Let's look at what happens. Let's look at what happens. When you look in chapter 4, verse 5, Starting at verse 5, I don't want to read that but for sake of time, but let's go down to verse 7. They're standing before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is a council of 70 who are, get this, who get, get this. They are the people who are considered to be the religious zealots of their day. The Sanhedrin was a council of 70 primarily made up of Pharisees, but the majority were Sadducees. Sadducees were people that did not believe in the resurrection. They, they really did not believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. They, they were the individuals, get this, who had a connection to the Roman government. Their philosophy was to keep peace with the Romans who were now in control. But subsequently what happened was because they sided with the Romans, the Jewish poor did not like them. Hello somebody. And so what happens is, what happens is they are seated on this council called the Sanhedrin Council. Sanhedrin council, you know, looked down their nose at everybody. They were the people uh, that, yes, that primarily gave challenge and difficulty even to Jesus. But when, when you look in verse 7, they're standing before the Sanhedrin. It says this, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked by what power or by what name have ye done this? Done what? Heal a man who stood in need of being healed. Well, why did you help the man? Allow me to paraphrase. The man been coming there, folk been bringing him to the gate every day. He ain't bothering nobody. Matter of fact, we got used to seeing him lay there by the gate begging. We were content with the man begging. He, he's not bothered anybody. He, he fit right in to the community. By what authority did you speak to this man and all of a sudden his ankle bones got strong and he jumped up and began leaping and praising. By what authority? Why did you help the man? We were satisfied looking at the man. As a matter of fact, some of us walked by daily and gave him an arm ourselves. By what authority did you do it? Look at verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made well? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, get this, that by the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. In other words, you're asking us, by what power? It's by the power of Jesus Christ. Talk to me, somebody. As you help folk, as you seek to bring about change in the lives of people, there are going to be folk that don't like it. But the bottom line is that you've got power. I say you've got power. If you've been saved, if you've been born again, you've got power. When people ask you by what authority you've helped somebody, tell them in the name of Jesus. The same Jesus that picked me up when I was down. Somebody in here got a testimony. 
the same Jesus that delivered me off of drugs, the same Jesus that healed my body, the same Jesus that opened doors in my life. It's by his power, it's by his authority that I help other people. I got to let y'all go. My time is up. I'm already over. Look at the text. The Bible says that they're upset with them. They say, by what authority? By what power? I'm glad today to know that I've got some power. Every individual who's really been born again, you've got power. As a matter of fact, I need you to help me identify the kind of power that you ought to have and you should have. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell them Holy Ghost power. Come on, those of you who really know that you've got power, I'm talking about showing up power, I need you to look at your neighbor and tell them I've got Holy Ghost power. Economic power is good, but I've got Holy Ghost power. Talk, Talk to me, somebody. Social power is good, but I've got Holy Ghost power. Political power has its place, but I've got Holy Ghost power. Can I tell you on this morning that there is no power likened under Holy Ghost power? If my grandmother were here, she would tell you the Holy Ghost will make you walk right. The Holy Ghost will make you talk right. The Holy Ghost will make you live right. The Holy Ghost will make you do right. Some of y'all act like y'all don't know him. So it seemed like a good time for me to ask a simple question. Do you know him? I say, do you? Do you know him? Look at Peter and John. They're standing before the Sanhedrin. Yes, they are questioning them about who it is that you represent. And they say unto them that we represent Jesus. I hear Peter in verse number 19 and 20 say that if it seem right unto you, yes, that you persecute us for doing the will of the Lord, uh, Peter says unto them, you've got to judge for yourself. He said, but what we're going to do is we're going to stand up for what we've seen and for what we've heard. In other words, we're witnesses for Jesus. I can imagine that Peter would say that I was with him when they whipped him all night long. I imagine that Peter would say that I was with him when he healed the sick and raised the dead. I can imagine that Peter said I was with him when he fed the multitude of more than 5,000 men beside women and children. I hear Peter, my brothers and sisters, literally saying, you can do with us what you want to do, but we're going to stand for the Lord. We're going to stand and be a witness for the Lord. I've got to go. My time is up, but the essence of the message is that if you have the Holy Ghost, And if you know Jesus for yourself, and if you've really been born again, then you ought to stand up for Jesus. It does not matter what people say. You ought to stand up for Jesus. You need to let a dying well know that it's for God I live, and it's for God I die. You need to let a dying well know 
that if it had not been for the Lord on my side there's no telling where I would be but I'm here right now by the grace of God I've been kept by the grace of God I've been kept by the mercy of God I've been sustained by the love of God and I move right now in the power of God somebody ought to stand up for Jesus somebody ought to stand up and declare and decree that Jesus loved me so much that he died for my sin when I was on my way to hell I wouldn't fit to live and not good enough to die he changed my life is there anybody here who's going to stand up for Jesus? I see some of y'all still sitting down, but I need somebody who's not ashamed to be a witness that he picked me up and he turned me around. He took my feet out of the mire clay and placed them on a rock to stay. Is there anybody here who's going to stand up for Jesus? I need you to look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I'm going to be a witness for the Lord tell him neighbor he been good to me neighbor he set me free neighbor he saved my soul and I gotta tell it I gotta tell it I've gotta tell it everywhere I go that I found a savior and he's sweet I know is there anybody here who loves my Jesus is there anybody here who loves my Lord why don't you praise his name why don't you stand up for him why don't you give him glory? Why don't you give him honor? Any alright? Any alright? Yeah! 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 I gotta let y'all go. I gotta let y'all go. I gotta let y'all go. I gotta let y'all do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, if the Lord needs somebody, I'm going to stand up for him. And the reason I'm going to stand up for him is because can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Has he been good to you? Shout it! Yeah! Shout it! Yeah! 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 I gotta let y'all go. I gotta let y'all go right where you are, right where you are, by your head. By your head, by your head, right where you are. Close your eyes, somebody. Somebody walked in the door today needing a relationship with Jesus. Those of us who are in this place right now who born again, we're going to stand up for him and vouch for him. We're going to vouch that he will save your soul. We're going to vouch that he's a healer that he's a deliverer, that he's a way maker, that he's a sustainer, 
that he's a keeper. He's able to change lives. And there's every, every head is bowed, every eye closed. Somebody may have walked in the mount on today not having relationship with Jesus. We would that you not leave here like you came. He's willing, he's able, he's ready to save your soul. To the utmost, Jesus saves. He will pick you up and he'll turn you around. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus saves. Every head is bowed, every eye closed. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, there are those in the aisles who are prepared to minister to you. They're going to pray with you. They're going to walk you down the aisle. But if you're here right now and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, I want you to know he loves you. Sir, ma'am, son, daughter, wherever you are, just stand up right now and make your way to the nearest aisle. Make your way to the nearest aisle and walk down that aisle. Jesus says he will pick you up. Yes, he will. And turn you around. Hallelujah. Jesus says if you hear an unsaved, will you come? Jesus saves to the utmost. Jesus saves. He will pick you up and turn you around. Hallelujah. Jesus saves. You might be here and you say, Pastor, I'm saved. But you're unchurched. Mount Pleasant would be delighted to become your church home and family if you're here, saved but unchurched. Will you make your way to the nearest aisle? Walk down that aisle right now. Come on. He will pick you up and turn you around. Hallelujah, Jesus say. You might be here and you say, Pastor, I'm going through something and I need special prayer. We'd be delighted to pray with you. If you make your way quickly to the altar, we want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. Those of you that are going through struggles, difficulties, challenges in life, we believe that the power of God is able to change things and turn you around. Hallelujah. Jesus saved. 